Yes, I will explain what is the significance of the parenthesis when we talk about the revolution. The other important contribution, the most important contribution in perspective by Flag and all of these are accessible. It's called the stake and revolution. One of the most important characterization of the state and what the revolution should be like. The other important contribution by Lenin is called left-wing communism and infantile disorder. You must familiarize yourselves with that. The other important contribution is called the role and functions of the trade unions under the new economic policy which was published in 1922 when he was in power. It's, it's part of the contributions, but there are so many other contributions that Lenin has bequeathed, has given over, has given as servant in a country small town called Simbrsk in Russia. When he was born, Russia was under the rulership of an empire of a royal family which was not having any democratic elections, was living large life, was living a lot of the people under poverty, was only looking after itself. But that royal family which was called the Tsar was also controlled by the British and American empires. In particular, the British Empire had direct control over the Russian Empire which Lenin was born under. And then he was born into a relatively middle class family. Like meaning that they were able to be taken care of. Like the father was a school inspector. The mother was relatively well off. Then he was able to gain access to education. His brother as well was in education. His brother became politically conscious. His brother was called Alexander. He became politically conscious and was so fed up with the dominance of the Tsar. And him and his friends, the brother of Lemin, thought that the only way to could defeat this system of the Tsar is to kill the Tsar himself, the king. The whole system, not just like that. Organization is central to a revolution. So he saw it practically closer to hope that if you are going to think as an individual, you will just assassinate the leader of a regional government and you are done with it without destroying the system. You are not going to go very far. And in many instances, you are bordering on possibility of being a terrorist. You are not a revolutionary. Here in South Africa, there was a, a person whom they later on characterized as insane or mad, who killed the fair food, was it fair food, in parliament. When the apartheid system, was fully fledged, went to parliament, gained access to a knife and stabbed a sitting head of state of apartheid that time. But apartheid did not die. And that is what we have to appreciate that even if we can feel very passionate about the changes that have to be made in any system, you can't conduct a revolution alone. You can play an important part. You can, like the league, inspire a generation to change their ideas, to reproduce yourselves ideologically. But you can't defeat a system by yourself. And Lenin got to appreciate that. So his political consciousness was shaped by that. He later on went to the university, joined the student movement, was expelled because he participated in the protest. And the then system, the government that time, was where that this one is a younger brother of the one who tried to kill the king, the Tsar. So we must be careful. And then from there they got to banish him, went to exile, but also then he began to come into contact with Marxism. 
at the age of 19. That is when he began to study and understand Marxism by the age of 19. The person who influenced him the most about understanding the Marxist theory, Marxist science, the Marxist political economy, was a revolutionary socialist called Plekhanov, who got to inspire his perspectives. He was still dealing with the biographical issues. I'm not going to stay there for a very long time. But then also Lenin then got involved in the Union for the Struggle for the Liberation of the Working Class in Russia, where he was raising the levels of the consciousness that, of course, as a union, you can fight for immediate wins and benefits, but you must understand that ultimately we must defeat the system and take over power so that we move towards a different direction. Now, I want to give a context, I'm going to talk now about his major contribution. Politically conscious, joined the Russian Social Democratic Party, becomes active, and realizes that within the party, the Russian Social Democratic Party, there are elements that are reformist, and then, then they formed a different outside organization. Numerically, they were a smaller number. But they call themselves the Bolsheviks. Bolsheviks means majority. So, Commissar Tebbi was saying the third biggest political party when she was speaking here. Yeah, I don't think we are the third political, biggest political party. We are qualitatively the biggest political party in South Africa as the year. We are the Bolsheviks of our times of the 21st century. We just have not yet taken over political power through the ballot, but we are going to end the world war. Dedicated all resources of Russia in the war of imperialism. And then a space opened because people began to suffer in Russia. There was no food, there was no guarantee of anything. Work was not guaranteed, there were systems were being destroyed. Infrastructure, because it was war, was being destroyed. It was on that basis that the revolutionary spirit was then implanted amongst the people that we need to overthrow the Tsar, we must demand peace, we must take over this government so that we can move towards a different direction. And then in February 1917, there was what was later on called the Bourgeois Democratic Revolution, but there was an overthrow of the Tsar. And it was not just an event, it was a series of revolutionary inspired activities. And then a provisional government, a temporary government was put in place after the February Revolution. And then in April of 1917, that is when Lenin began to publish what we say earlier on that is the April Thesis. The April Thesis were pamphlets and ideas that was agitating that we cannot have, we cannot replace the Tsar with a bourgeois government. A government which is still loyal to the imperialist masters. A government who still wants capitalism to reign. A government who still wants to retain inequalities. Then the April Thesis was agitating that we must pass from the first stage of the revolution. Which, he said, owing to the insufficient class consciousness and organization of the proletariat, placed power in the hands of the bourgeoisie. So the April Thesis were ideas to say that we cannot agree on this reformist arrangement that has happened. Of course we overthrew the Tsar, but let us raise the levels of class consciousness of the workers and of the peasants to overthrow 
the, the entire system. And then in October of 1970, on the 25th of October, a revolution, a properly planned revolution by the Bolsheviks was able to overthrow the provisional government and then have a revolutionary government led by Lenin. And the overthrow of the provisional, provisional government by the Bolsheviks that were led by Lenin was not a spontaneous activity, it was planned in a meeting, there are even minutes, which said that Trotsky is going to be responsible for this, Stalin will be responsible for that, and so and so and so on and so forth. It was not spontaneous. Revolutions must not be permitted to be spontaneous. Majority of the times, spontaneity does not lead to any revolution. Spontaneity is what happened in the so-called Arab Springs, where people just rioted that there is no leadership. A government falls, but there is no real replacement by a revolutionary government. Those things that happened in Tunisia, that happened in Egypt, that happened in Libya, to the extent that the imperialists realized that these people are leaderless, they want to impose their own government there and even took over the resources of those countries. So as revolutionaries, we must never ever dream for a so-called spontaneous revolution. I hear people say that the, the masses are going to rise by themselves, they're going to overthrow government. There will never be such a thing. Because we must be there to lead the people towards the revolutionary path. That is clearly defined. All together. We must never allow for spontaneity that is not clearly defined. Spontaneity is that those riots which happened in KZN and parts of the July riots, when Zuma was arrested and people just went on craziness. No leader of those things, they just happened. Out of genuine frustrations of the inequalities that happened in South Africa, people just went mad. And government started to conspire that they are leaders of that nonsense. There was no leader of that thing. There was no leader of that thing, it just happened by itself. And, and, and so we have, as a revolutionary movement, have to organize the people to lead a revolutionary agenda in terms of uh, what is required. And then after the October Revolution, then the Bolsheviks took power and established the socialist Russia. But also because of the internationalism, they began to establish something called the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR. So the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics were 15 independent countries that all ascribed to one leadership of the Communist Party under the leadership of Vladimir Lenin. It had more than 200 million people. But the amount of progress that was recorded under the leadership of Lenin was too much. When Lenin took over Russia, it was a bad one. The working class in Russia was just 10% of the population. Majority were peasants. But when Lenin took over power, he was able to lead faster and much more impactful industrialization. Was able to create jobs for the people there. It was actually a crime to be unemployed under the USSR. Everyone else had to do something. They provided education for all the people for free, proper health care for all the people, produced the highest number of scientists. When the world was under the threat of elimination by polio, it was the Russian, the USSR, that got to produce a vaccine that stopped polio to zero. 
under a socialist government, the fastest growing economy happened under a planned economy that got to be guided by Vladimir Putin, even with the new economic policy. He said, let us allow some sectors to trade as if it's in a capitalist system. But what is non-negotiable is that the land must remain in the hands of the state. Because when the revolution happened in October 1917, and majority led by females, by women, the demand was land, peace, and jobs. Land, peace, and bread. Not jobs. Land, peace, and bread. Because people said we want the land. We want peace because that time the world war was still ongoing. And then they said we want bread because there was no food. Those were the primary demands led by females that caused the Russian Revolution. And under the leadership of Vladimir Lenin, there were so many achievements that got to define the USSR. We spoke about all those achievements. But the most important thing is that despite being a superpower, the USSR never used its military strength to colonize other parts of the world. Yeah, yeah. They never took over colonies. Instead, they joined and funded the anti-colonial movements. So, so the anti-colonial struggles in Vietnam and China were practically funded and ideologically guided by the USSR. The anti-colonial struggles here in the African continent were funded and guided by the USSR. The USSR was involved in the anti-apartheid struggles took care of so many people from the former liberation movement, sent soldiers to Quito Kondavan to physically fight against apartheid soldiers, to defeat apartheid. And when they fight and win the anti-colonial battles, the USSR did never, never said that now that we have liberated you, give us mining rights, we want to take your gold. Give us oil rights in Angola, want to take your oil. Angola is one of the biggest producers of oil, but Russia never said because we play the role in your liberation, we're going to take your oil now. They play a far much more significant role. But also the most important thing is that when the Second World War happened, it was essentially Russia that used the USSR that used its strength to defeat the fascist regime of Hitler. And Hitler's intention was to dismantle the USSR, the, U the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. He said that this war is about dismantling that. And there was a second world war which led to the death of more than 30 million people. And at the center of that defeat was the USSR, which was founded by Vladimir Ulyanov Lenin in terms of what happened. Now, there are three or two outcomes from the Second World War. One was the production of two superpowers. Once Hitler was defeated in the Second World War, there emerged two superpowers the United States of America and its allies, mostly countries from Western Europe, and then the USSR. That is one outcome. The second outcome was the formation of the United Nations in 1945. Was a response that to stop another world war, let us form a multilateral organization which primarily must be comprised of all countries in the world, but must have five countries that are victors or the ones that played a major role 
in the Second World War. That is why we have got the five permanent members. The United States of America, China, France, Russia, the countries that played and Britain, the countries that played, and Germany is not in the Security Council permanent membership, despite the fact that Germany has got the biggest economy in Europe. So the participation in the permanent Security Council was not because of the biggest economy, was because of who are the victors in the Second World War. Now, the UN is formed. There is two superpowers. Superpowers means that as a single country, or as a single bloc, you have got enough armaments to could fight against the whole world alone. That is the capacity which the USSR had and possibly Russia still has today. That is the capacity which the United States had and possibly still have today. So you have got enough guns and, and, and bigger and army and armaments and bombs and fighting machines that can fight against the whole world by yourself. That is called the superpower. But the superpowers, the Americans then got to recruit a lot of reactionary countries whom they had with development in Europe called through the Marshall Plan and all those things. Russia on the other side did not expand, it was helping the anti-colonial movements. And everywhere where Russia was helping the anti-colonial movements, the United States, the CIA, was involved to counter Russia's anti-colonial strikers. Patrice Lumumba was killed by the United States of America yeah. because they were suspecting that the Russians are behind his rise to power. A lot of governments that had sympathies with the USSR in the African continent were overthrown by colonialists. So Kotori was overthrown in Guinea. Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown in Ghana through American influence. Because everywhere, so they, in, the, in that period, it was called the Cold War, where they've got two superpowers. They never physically confront each other because they had nuclear weapons. Because they've got nu nuclear weapons, if they fight amongst each other, the world is going to come to an end. But then everywhere where there was a war, they were all funding and supporting opposing factions. In Vietnam, the war lasted for a very long time. Proxy war happening there. The anti-colonial struggles, the reason why it took us forever to defeat apartheid is because the United States of America, Britain, and all of these Powerful countries were supporting apartheid. So now we say the UN is formed in 1945. In 1949, the United States of America, Britain, they formed an organization called the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, which was basically a war alliance. They undermined world peace efforts. They say, let us form a military alliance to watch against the USSR. So NATO was formed to be a, a military counterbalance to the, the, the power of the USSR. All the countries that colonized the African continent are the foundational members of NATO. And the NATO articles say that if any country attacks one of those countries within NATO, that country will be treated as if it has attacked all NATO members, they must fight back together. It's gangsterism. 
<laughs> yes, yeah, touch one, touch all. That is how it is. It gets the reason of NATO. The UN is formed to build world peace, and then here is America and Britain, they go and form the war alliance. And then the USSR say they met in a country called Belarus, it's one of the 15 socialist republics, and formed something called the Warsaw Pact. Warsaw is the name of the, the capital city of, uh, of Belarus to counter NATO. But with time, the USSR disintegrated all those socialist republics, which included, by the way, Ukraine, disintegrated. So it is part of the 15 socialist republics which were founded by Vladimir Lenin, included Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, the country, Lithuania, Estonia, Ukraine, and all those countries in the Eastern Europe. And when the U USSR disintegrated, in 1989 to 1991, people in the world, there was excitement in the world that this means the defeat of socialism is the end of history all over the world. In terms of uh, what got to happen. But this war alliance, the NATO one, which was formed to fight against the USSR, did not stop to exist even when the USSR had collapsed. They continued to expand and even expanded to, to the socialist republics that used to belong to the Russian-led USSR. At the center of the war, the necessary military intervention now in Ukraine is an effort to counterbalance or to fight back against NATO expansion. Because there are still colonial and neo-colonial aspirations yes. that define Britain, that define America. They still think that they will turn all these countries in the world into their colonial villages, colonial outposts. So there is nothing wrong with Vladimir Putin now fighting back against NATO's expansion to Eastern Europe. There's absolutely nothing wrong. And we as an anti-imperialist movement, the EFF, we can't even ask ourselves which side do we support or not. We have answered that question when the EFF was founded in 2013. We said we are an anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist movement. <laughs> and imperialism is what America is doing of expanding itself, is what Britain is doing of taking other countries' natural resources for their own benefit. So when we see their expansionist activities, we oppose. When someone opposes the expansion of imperialism, we support that. Whatever it takes, we must never agree to be under the imperialism and imperialist control of Britain, of America. Because they've got military bases all over the world, including here in Botswana. That is why we, we, we must never abandon, we must never neglect that program of having a proper government of the people in Botswana. Because all those people that have led Botswana from Kama the Elder, Masire, Kama the Younger One, even the one who is there now called Masisi, they are all puppets of British imperialism and American imperialism. And we have to liberate them. We have to liberate the people of Botswana from imperialist control. Go to Botswana today, there's not even one black person who is involved 
in, in actual owning of the mineral resources that are there. Diamonds, chrome coal, they are all taken by American and British imperialism with the assistance of the head of state and government. We have to change that. Because our liberation, our economic emancipation struggle is not just limited to these borders called South Africa. We are interested in the liberation of the people of Botswana, of Zimbabwe, of Namibia, of Swaziland. That is why we went two days ago to say that Mswati must democratize, must leave office, and then there must be democracy in Swaziland. That is, that is the internationalist character. It's not even a question of debate. It's the questions which the National Assembly on what is to be done has responded to on the internationalist character of uh, the EFF. Now, we have dealt with all these issues. The biography of Lenin, where he comes from, his contributions theoretically, him leading the USSR, founding the USSR, which has played an important role in the anti-colonial struggles, which has played an important role in the liberation and balancing out against imperialism in the entire world. Now, to us, what you want to talk as to what are the lessons that we can draw from Vladimir Lenin? What do we learn from Vladimir Ulyanov Lenin? One, we have been taught properly about the character of the state. So Marx had dealt with the question of the state and Lenin, when he wrote the state and revolution and gave so many lectures on it, he was able to properly characterize what is this thing, this institution, the armed bodies of men called the state, the so-called government plus executive and judiciary and military and police. Where does it come from? And then he said that the, the reason why we have got a state existence is because we have got a class-divided society. So in all class-divided societies, you will have an authority that emerges as if it is a neutral authority to mediate between the irreconcilable differences between the two major classes in society. Classes referring to a group of people. So in a capitalist system, the two classes is the capitalists and the working class. The working class includes all of us who rely on our labor for survival. So under capitalism, so the unique thing about capitalism is that one, it produces commodities, but also it creates fictional scarcity. Yes. That there must be shortage of things so that they can trade them at whatever prices that they do. Capitalism produces things not because there is a need. It produces because it wants to make money and enrich few people. So under capitalist system, when they produce bread and produce maize meat, produce food, build houses, they are not doing that because there is a need for food. They are doing it because they want to sell that in the market. That is what capitalism does. And organizations that exist in society, they either, even if they have not said it themselves, they either represent the capitalists or the working class. The EFF has said that we are an anti-capitalist movement which is on the side of the working class. And what does that mean that there's public representatives here? It means that everything else that we do, the question we ask is, how do the people benefit out of what we are doing now? 
when you are in a municipality council and legislature and parliament, when they bring the laws, when they bring the budgets, the question you ask is how do the people benefit out of these things? But the ones who represent the capitalists, the Ramaphosas and the ANC people, whenever there's a project, whenever there's a law, the question they ask is how does business benefit out of this? When there is distribution of electricity, they say that yes, we want to give electricity, but this electricity distribution is owned by a state-owned company. How do we make it to benefit private capitalists? And then they destroy ESCOM, they, they mutilate it into three divisions, and then they say the private sector capitalists must be the ones that generate electricity. That is how they think because they represent the capitalists. That is why every time they open their mouth, they say, no, there's a crisis in healthcare. What is the solution? Let us go and look for capitalists to benefit out of that. <laughs> Yesterday we were at the land bank, we were doing an oversight visit. They say, well, there's a land bank which is supposed to help agricultural development. But how do capitalists benefit them? And then they put agencies of Africaners in front of the land bank to be the ones who administer the loans of land bank. We are talking today, the land bank loan book is more than 86% white male farmers. So-called land bank is supposed to transform agriculture in South Africa. More than 86% of the money that is given for agricultural development is given to white male farmers. Like exclusively like that. And it does not even make any commercial sense because when you try to check why are you not giving developmental farming and small scale agriculture, they can't even say because those ones they fail, because they don't fail. The ones who default the most are those white male farmers. But they continue to be the biggest beneficiary. So what distinguishes the EFF from all these other nonsensical right organizations is that in everything else that we do, we ask how do the people benefit here? That is why in our founding manifesto, we say we must build state capacity in order to abolish tenders. The ANC has got a tender system because it says, yes, we want to build a road, but some private individual must benefit in the building of the road. We want to build a school, but a private capitalist must benefit in the building of the school. The purpose is not a school. The purpose is about enriching that one individual. In the EFF is how do we benefit the people? Every time you are in council, every time you are interacting with the situation, you must ask how do our people benefit out of this thing? There's a gas amendment bill which is going through public hearings. The question that you must ask is this gas amendment bill, how do our people benefit them? The Minerals and Petroleum Resources Development Act. How do we get our people to benefit out of that? But the manner in which these representatives of the capitalist system, the ANC, the DA, they are all looking for the interests of capitalists that are directly controlled by them. That is why they unashamedly say that but investors will not be able with this law. That is why when we go to parliament and say let us expropriate land without compensation, they say no, the investors will not be able, the capitalists will not be able, white capitalists will not be able with this. But 
ourselves we say, let us expropriate land without compensation for equal redistribution. Because at the center of the agenda of the AFF is the people, not the capitalists. On everything else that we do, but we must caution as well, comrades, that we are beginning to have elements amongst our public representatives as the EFF, come some we say, who are beginning to develop capitalist mannerisms. Yes. They are, they are, they are, um, within EFF public representatives, we have got amongst those who are beginning to develop capitalist mannerisms and conduct. When they get into municipalities, they befriend supply chain management, befriend municipal managers. And then, when they say tender, when they say budget, they go and ask the question which is asked by ANC criminals. How do we make money out of this? They don't go to conspire with the municipal manager as to how do we benefit people out of this? They conspire with them, asking for themselves. And that is not what the EFF is all about. If you thought the EFF is about private benefit and, and, and about self-enrichment, you are in the wrong organization. You are completely in the wrong organization. And the system will deal with you by itself. The, the good thing is that we pay close attention. So the one who, There's rules in terms of uh, what we then do. So I have learned from Vladimir Lenin about the character of the state, that it is an instrument which otherwise was supposed to be mediating between the two classes but it becomes an instrument of the ruling class. It is an instrument of class domination. It arises out of the irreconcilability of class contradictions, so antagonism. So in the, in the bigger English which Lenin uses, he says, the state is the product of the irreconcilability of class antagonisms, class antagonisms. That the fact that we cannot reconcile this is class interest, that is when the state, and despite the fact that it emerges like that, it still becomes an instrument of capitalist class rule in a capitalist society. That is the characterization which we have learned from Lenin. That is why when workers are fighting with mine bosses, with capitalists in America, the state does not go there to try to make it between the two. It goes straight on the side of the mining capitalist and even key workers. That is why when we protest against factories of capitalism, it does not even have an institution to say, let's find a way of resolving your problems. They come and use tear gas on you because the role is to preserve the status quo the people. When we take over the state as the EFS, it is going to be utilized to benefit the people. It is going to be on the side of the working class and the poor. It is going to make sure that everything else that is done, the question of who stands to benefit should have been responded to first. And that question should have been responded in a way that says it is the ordinary people that must benefit. When they ask you what is the difference between you and the ANC is that we stand for the people, the ANC stand for capitalists. That is what they stand for. Then, they say, give us an example. They say that the reason why they are not building these roads is because they have not yet got a tender to get one person to benefit. The reason why they are not building clinics is because they are not giving tenders to, for one person. But the government, if 
could employ engineers, project managers, were supposed to be the ones who are directly, without tenders, building roads, building clinics, repairing schools, and giving services to our people. That is what distinguishes us with these puppets of capitalists. Of this, so in a organization, you have a logo of we have an agenda in Syria. In a organization, they represent a one in Karenwa. I represent a peer to represent a one. Well, that's what I got up benefit. There is a scope, there is capacity in South Africa to benefit all the people with the resources that we have, yes. but the capitalist system is making sure that there is only few individuals that benefit. That is what we learn from Lenin. But we also learn from him because he teaches us Marxism, the science of Marxism, that it is only through a Marxist proper application of Marxist theory that we will realize faster development of the productive forces. You see, when you develop the economy, when you build industries, when you build houses, when you build dams and bridges, without the profit motive, you will do it faster. But if the, the, the motive is profit, you will never do it faster. Go and check in China. China in 1978, it was poorer than South Africa in 1978, but with a lot of people. It was poorer than Ghana. But when they started to develop the productive forces without the immediate profit motive, China is the second biggest economy in the world today. China has taken more than 700 million people outside of poverty. It has never happened anyway has been the most dynamic rail system because there is no immediate profit motive. We can, here in South Africa, develop this culture properly. We can build new cities. We can build new industries. We can interconnect the transport system, railway, bullet trains proper, not imaginations of Ramaphosa. That can interconnect the entire country and even interconnect with the continent. If we have proper revolutionary government, that is going to guide us. And that government can only be the EFF because we are the only organization that stands on the behalf of the people. So, Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, who, when he was exiled, called himself Lenin. is a teacher of Marxism. He taught us Marxism. And his proper application in practice is the one who said that you cannot have practice that is not theoretically grounded. But also you cannot just believe in theories that are not guided by practice. Like you, there, there must be a constant interrelationship between theory and practice. That is what Vladimir Lenin has taught us. That you cannot have a revolutionary movement that is not grounded on solid theoretical foundation. But also Lenin has taught us about organization. When he was Yama, he says correctly that you give me one generation of youth, I'm going to change the world. Even when he realizes his capacity to could contribute to society, to reproduce himself, he still appreciates the essence and the centrality of organization. That is why we have to safeguard organization. This thing which we have we have here the EFM. It's, it's a most important weapon, the most important instrument in the hands of the people of South Africa. 
There is no any other vehicle to fight for proper liberation except the EFL. There is no movement that can do that. There is no organization that is fighting for black people. That is fighting for the unity of black people in the African continent and the entire diaspora. So you know in the constitution of the EFF we have got principles of organizational democracy which we literally copied and pasted from the Leninist guidance on how organizations must run. The principle of elected and collective leadership. I'm going to close with that. The principles of organizational democracy in the EFF. That we learn from Lenin, you must go and check the writings of an institute which was founded under the Bolsheviks called the Marx, Angels and Lenin Institute. And the principles of organizational democracy, which we copied and pasted because they are applicable to our conditions now. Elected and collective leadership. What that means is that even if you are a branch chairperson or regional chairperson or provincial chairperson, you must always subject yourself to the collective. You don't become creative to say, no, as chair, I'm changing these decisions that were taken. I'm the chairperson. <laughs> and then you even refer to the branch secretary as my secretary. It's not your secretary, it's branch secretary. <laughs> the branch of said, this is my deputy, this one is my secretary, this one is, no, those are not your people. Those are branch leaders. They are elected into those responsibilities for those responsibilities. They are saying in the constitution what they are doing there. It's not your secretary, it's branch secretary. That is why even if you leave there, the secretary remains. Even if you resign or we remove you through a process, the secretary of the branch remains. So the, the, the principle of collective leadership we learn from Lenin, that the powers of the National Assembly, that once you've got an organization, a unitary organization, once decisions have been taken by a national conference, they must bind all of you. You don't change decisions midway because we're not consistent in terms of what does. The other important principle is democratic centralism. That we've got democratic consultation within the organization on all the times, on all the issues. We must consult each other. But once decisions have been taken, your right to disagree with those decisions is no longer significant. So democratic centralism means that we have consulted each other democratically where all of us say this is what is going to happen. And once decisions have been taken, your right to disagree dwindles into insignificance. That is what it means. But also it means that Decisions of upper structures are binding on lower structures. When you articulate a decision at national level, you can't say, no, as a province, we disagree with national office. There's no such a thing. There's an organization, the formal liberation movement. I once saw a provincial secretary somewhere condemning a secretary general. I was like, that can happen. In the EFF, it can happen. <laughs> it's not possible. Is not possible. Even if we have got fundamental differences with the decisions, even if you don't understand the, the decision, you must go and defend it. That is what guides us. That is what keeps the organization together. That the decisions of upper structures are binding on our structure. Sometimes we must dissolve structures and even tell you to go and explain the, your decision. That no comrades who have taken a decision, not that day. 
You must say, we have taken a decision to dissolve the structure which I used to be chairperson of. That is how organizational democratic centralism operates. You don't speak about them and us in one organization. You own up to all the decisions that are taken internally in terms of what happens. The other principle that we learn from Vladimir Ulyanov Lenin is mandates, accountability, and reporting. That all the time we must be mandated, we must be accountable for our decisions, we must constantly report about what we have been mandated to do. But also we learn from Lenin the principle of constructive criticism and self-criticism. Yeah, yeah. Some of the Communist parties overextended that principle. The Communist Party of China, for instance. When we have made a mistake, they will make you to write an essay to criticize yourself. <laughs> to say, I have done the following, I'm a reactionary, I'm problematic, I'm lazy. <laughs> but self-criticism must happen. We must tell each other when we think that there's weaknesses. So sometimes we find fighters have got good points to make. But when someone pushes a bit back, they go back as well. Because if you are a fighter and you are to create a position where you say that, I'm saying we must abolish tenders here in the municipality. When they say, what do you mean? How are we going to do it? There's not even capacity. Don't you know, say that I say we must abolish tenders. But we have got people who can articulate positions, what anything. They can't persuade anyone. And you can't call yourself a fighter if you can't persuade anyone because at the center of our revolution now is persuasion. Persuasion is, is how you convince other people. Lenin says that give me a generation for just one generation of young people, I will change the whole world. Have you changed even your village? Have you convinced your village about the EFF? When did you join the EFF? Who have you persuaded? If we are this Leninist organization, are you, are you reproducing yourself ideologically? Are you persuading other people to see the world in the same way? That is it. Here is one individual from Simbrisk in Russia, born on the 22nd of April 1870. He says that there is no social media at that time. There is no television sites that will broadcast all over and everything else. He says, give me one generation of young people, I'm going to change the world. Before the year 1900, he says, just one generation, I'm going to change the whole world. With all forms of assistance and access to materials, what can you change? Can you, can you change even the thinking of the people around you? to understand the movement that we are saving and the agenda that we are in pursuit of. Those are the, some of the principles that we are learning from Vladimir Lenin, but also we learn the principle of discipline. Discipline is doing things that you are supposed to do, is to not get engaged in factionalism. Discipline means that you must hold up to every decision that you take. You must be able to repeat in public what you say in private. Private. That is discipline. So everything else that if you are a leader, everything else that you do in private, you must be able to hold up to it in public. <laughs> everything. <laughs> you must be able to hold up to it in public. 
the things you do and the things that you say. So that is how that is how it should be. And hard work is to dedicate yourself to work of the organization. Hard work means you must be focused. You must always do work of the movement. You find a person says, I'm very busy here. I can't say I was busy here. I'm very busy. And then you don't go and rush branches. Don't go and recruit people and say you're busy. It's cancer. Busy with what? Cancer says once per month. It's once a month or once per three months. Once a month. Once a month. Some of them three. And some of months and then they say, oh, I'm very busy. <laughs> and the good thing that we say this ourselves as national leaders is because we live by these principles. We criticize ourselves, we engage in self-criticism. We do well of the organization. We don't theorize about it. Like that. When they say we must do work of the organization, we do work of so we can't we don't come to you to demand you to be hardworking when we are not hardworking in ourselves. We are not demanding from you what we cannot do ourselves. We recruit for the organization. We go to all corners of this country, wherever it is, to, to speak to members of the EFF, potential members of the EFF, persuade them and still get involved in work that was deployed for in parliament and still go to school and still go try to take care of private issues as well. <laughs> and in fact, there are, you know, there's something that happens which shocks me all the time. You find a person who is a leader of a region, say, no, my region is too fast. Reaching fast. Sometimes even a person complaining about it, but this municipality is too fast. From what two to what eight, it's very far. First, the whole South Africa is not fast. The whole country is not a very big country. And then you are complaining about small spaces. We need think and imagine like Vladimir Lenin, who must be guided by selflessness, love for the organization and love for one another. That is the principle which the Second National People's Assembly added to the principles that we copied and pasted from the Leninist principles of a Vanguard party that must lead the entirety of society. We must be committed to the revolution. There are immediate tasks, I'm sure the leadership will talk to that in conclusion that we must engage in. All Fridays, all public representatives must be recruiting new members of the EFF. We are in a stage now of one million membership. And when we set up public recruitment stations, you must go and recruit people, they must go to the center of the country. And when now they realize that now power is going, if they come to us, we don't even need to, before they even call us to say, let us talk about power sharing. The principles, we have already published the principles. Expropriation of land without compensation must happen. Fee free quality education for all up until postgraduate level. <laughs> free quality health care for our people. Abolishment of tenders. Free sanitary towels for people. We are getting closer to getting these things. But we will not achieve that if electorally we continue to decline. We must reproduce ourselves. We must feel guilty as a member, as an activist of the EFF. If the whole day finishes without you having spoken to new members, to new people, sometimes convincing some of the strategic people and members of society might not happen in one day. Sometimes you can even start by just saying, I'm just coming to visit. Talk about football, talk about the church, talk
talk about peace and that. And then we said, no, let's meet again next week Sunday. Talk about something else. But later on, we said, but you know, this, this thing of the if, I think we can go this road. As friends, strategic recruitment of people who when they speak society will respect. So I am a recruiter everywhere. It's not explained that the ANC gets 70 plus percent here in Verne and Mopana, in Guyana. The conditions of our people are not proper. Abuna Mam, Abuna Kwaba, Chumushita, we government, La Guyana. Proper to all the villages. What is difficult to explain? Just a simple thing like that. The people are already aware of the conditions that were. Since so July, January, with the EFF, we must go and talk to the people. Not with the Tamarayashem, the Rewa, the Chikachika, the Rayashem, the Nadisiban, the one organization. We must bring as many people as possible to this movement. It's not a difficult thing. If truly we have got these WCTs, 10 members each. Even if you can send this target to each WCT member, must recruit 10 people per week. It's two people per day. You can't convince two people the whole day. Two. <laughs> the whole day. You can't convince two people per day, but you say, I'm a fighter, I'm a fighter. Viva CIC, Viva Revolution, Seven Cardinal Pillars, but you can't convince two people. <laughs> we need to take our work much more serious and go to the ground and do work of the organization. All the time, we must do the work. And we must also begin to raise the levels of consciousness and take up critical issues. There are lots of governance issues that we have to deal with in a separate platform that they have to be attended to. Because there is too much negligence and incapacity that defines councillors of almost all municipalities. And we need to then intervene to guide all of them. So that when we are talking about what we are going to do when we take over government, there are some strategic wins that we can achieve in the immediate. That is what we are going to engage on. Let us continue to fight fighters. Let us continue to celebrate. The life and times of Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov Lenin. Amanda! Viva EFF! Viva! Viva EFF! Viva! Amanda! EFF!
President. Uh, thank you very much, Comrades Gimbong and Nogue. Go figure me. Go need. Go full of cars, full of duty. Every RILC member in the first meeting of the RILC, Niklo Mola test, Kalek Charakapa Tuto Yagagi. Thank you. Yeah, I am safely. 